thank you so much everyone and we are going to start with the first of the sessions that is getting to know Podman and Podman Desktop and Friends by Karan and Ranki. Karan, Ranki, please go to the stage. All right guys, so I'm Karan and he's my friend Ramki. Ramki. So here I want you guys to pick up your phone, take your wallet and prove me that you can drive. Scan this QR code and upload your driving lessons. And don't share your Aadhaar. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm just kidding, so um, you can scan this, uh, it, it's, a, it's a mini game, we are obsessed about cars, so Burr showed a fantastic demo of you guys are competing with, uh, with grey and yellow cars, I have a different one, it's a hybrid car that does not have any wheels, so it would be interesting for you. Uh, meanwhile, let me, let me go brief about what we're going to talk about, so Ramki is going to go over and show you, uh, tell you about a, a nice story of containers, how this all evolved and how this came up into a specification, a community around it, and the runtime landscape. So all of those great things that Ramgi is going to talk about. Then we will dive deep into uh, developer tools for containers, how you can run, build, and manage containers effectively on a local machine, onto OpenShift, as well as using Docker. And then we'll show you some, some more uh, cool stuff about how you can do it live uh, by using the things that we're doing right now. So, it's a mini game, I guess you guys have, uh, uh, this should be working for you if uh, internet is serving well for us. How many of you are able to just open up the game? Is it working? One, two? Oh, all of them, fantastic. So show us your driving skills. And in next 10 seconds, we're gonna flip over to understand what is the technology which is kind of powering this mini game that we have built up for you guys. All right, so time over. I'll give you enough time to play this game with me in a couple of seconds, but uh, I'll hand over to Ramki right now to talk about containers and learn how it goes. Thank you. Please. Hey, hi, Namaskara. How are you guys? Um, so, uh, one of the things uh, is how many here believe code is an asset? Show of hands. And how many of you believe code is a liability? <laughs> right? You see the difference, right? And with open source, uh, things uh, has built, have been built on a lot of legacy technologies and there's a lot of innovations also go on because of the, because commercial, open, uh, commercial technologies in many of these areas can't solve the scale problems and if you take a look at most of the larger Indian startups, they have, embarrassed, uh, have, they have uh, embraced a lot of uh, open source technologies to build their own stacks. Not just thing, most of the things what you have done uh, what you've been doing uh, in, in, like, say, mm -hmm. your uh, booking your railway tickets, authenticating yourself oh, yeah. against a government service, uh, whatever you have done, most of you might have used container technologies and Kubernetes to come here also without knowing that you have used those technologies. So, but where do these technologies come from? And uh, what are, what are um, uh, the historical things which have happened way back in the day uh, for, what, for how uh, container technologies are today? So it all started in 1979. Any developers here from 1979? Uh, if you are there, I mean, I would like to pick your brain. Uh, but it all started with this project called CHROOT, which came in uh, Unix as V5. And what, whatever you're seeing today uh, has origins from 1979. And uh, this was one of those important um, software interfaces written in Unix, where your applications could make a copy of itself uh, uh, into the root and have its own shared privileges. And this was like very huge at that given point of time. This, this technology itself kind of revolutionized the adoption of Unix uh, in all the major computing what you're seeing. And most of the things what you're seeing, your Android phone, derivative of Unix, your Mac, your Apples, all of them are derivatives of Unix. There's no such technology right now which uh, you're using has not been thought, envisioned, during back in the day, like all the great engineers in AT&T, Bell Labs, Berkeley University, MIT, uh, all these engineers contributed to what technology is today, and especially with the internet. How many of you are writing programming in a proprietary programming language now? None. Most of the open source programming languages, most of the languages, all of those things are built by open standard. So it started off in 1979, and then another uh, uh, distribution called the FreeBSD uh, implemented the syscalls with more uh, features towards the networking. And the networking stack, what you're seeing right now, all its origins come from uh, BSD. 
And then for the first time, uh, 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 for example, in 2004, 2003, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of innovations. SE Linux was one of those innovations, uh, uh, which was done by the National Security Agency of US. And then they had a collaboration with Red Hat to co-maintain this project. And whatever you're seeing you, uh, as the mandatory access control by far, SE Linux is one of the largest uh, adopted uh, uh, access control projects. And for the first time in 2004, Sun introduces containers. That's the first time they coined the term containers. So it was in Solaris, they called it Solaris containers. It was a trans transitory term because they rebranded re it to Solaris zones at that given point of time. And quite a few of these uh, projects started uh, adopting this. But what, what had happened is uh, because uh, it, was, it was more from a feature point of view and not from a security point of view. If you take a look at the older manuals, they'll tell uh, not to run chroot or most of the security literature at that given point of time discouraged you from using chroot. So this, this was happening. And in Linux, the container ecosystem kind of uh, uh, built on these primitives in 2008 when the Linux container project, uh, the LXC project came out. LXC project had three main things. One is namespaces. The uh, na namespaces, the second one is uh, your mandatory access control with SE Linux. And the third one is your C groups. Uh, what, uh, on which most of the resource sharing and uh, the process sharing and isolations have been, uh, have been taken place. These three uh, projects for, for a long time were uh, one of the bases for most of the pro projects which were distributed at that time. And during the PyCon uh, 2013, one of the li lightning talks, Cloud, which later on went to become the Docker project, they announced the, uh, they announced the project. Uh, what they had done is they had taken all the uh, uh, the, the container, engineer, uh, container engine at that given point of time was actually from LXC. And uh, what they did after that time is uh, they used the namespaces of that thing, but they had a demon in their architecture in, in terms of both the hosts, both the clients, and the root uh, needed those demons to run in order to, uh, in order to isolate. But what it did was for, for a developer, it kind of solved the packaging problem, and from the ops person, he started... Uh, they, they started getting uh, the applications to be deployed in the same way the developer intended to. But what usually happens with technologies or like any uh, decisions is there's something called the Javon's paradox. So what it does is when you try to make certain systems efficient, uh, the whole purpose of it, because people are going to consume resources again over and over again, it's going to defeat the purpose of resource consumption again. So what started happening is everybody started packaging it as as containers, and uh, it, it, it just blew out in the market that everybody wanted to make their applications as containers and distribute it to things. Now, the problem is lots of uh, containers were out there, and how do you orchestrate these containers? So at that given point of time, academia, companies, everybody had their own opinion. Even, even Red Hat had its own opinion. Uh, it was called Gary. No, I'm not sure if, uh, any, anyone has used, used that. Uh, so, so what started happening was everybody started um, using uh, their own opinionated way of uh, uh, how containers need to be orchestrated and uh, there were all these wars going on and uh, like certain patches from uh, certain patches from the community and certain patches from other companies were not accepted by docker as a company because what 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 the community was dealing with is docker as a company and docker as a project too so you see the you, you see the place where uh, i'm going towards because monopolies in technologies can form very easily, okay? And uh, the way Unix has survived and the way most of the technology has survived and adopted in the open source world is by standardization. So it, they needed a standardization body in order to say, how should a file system look like? What should, uh, what should a container look like? What is a container? Is it a, is it a container from Docker as a company or, or as a project? So all of these things started and uh, under the Linux Foundation umbrella, most of you might have heard of this organization called CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. So that one started coming, it was a very young foundation and all, and it started speaking, uh, uh, it, it started collaborating with the engineers from most of these companies, uh, Docker, Red Hat, AWS, IBM, uh, most of these companies, and they started contributing code or donating code uh, under, under the umbrella of CNCF, so that whatever technology is what you're seeing right now, uh, most of these technologies also grew. So, so the whole containerization technology and, uh, uh, and all of the adoptions of various uh, platforms. Uh, 2014, Google uh, started developing Kubernetes in the open um, uh, because that's 
that's one of the ways Google learned its lessons from, from back in the day of doing open source to doing open source right. And they started developing uh, uh, Kubernetes out in the open and there were many contributors. Red Hat was also one of the earlier co companies to contribute to, uh, to, uh, to contribute to Kubernetes as a project. And Kubernetes by far started getting the most traction in terms of it, it being a viable uh, container orchestration platform which both enterprises can adopt and also, um, uh, uh, and also um, uh, uh, most of the projects started growing around the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, so what started happening is uh, uh, quite a few projects uh, right now started uh, adopting these, primit these technologies which were built from like all the way from 1970s CH rule till, till now in, in the way that they, this is how a container should be built. It was kind of opinionated. Then the whole standardization process has started uh, coming in and quite a few uh, container runtime uh, spec came out and then uh, uh, how an interface within, with, within the Kubernetes uh, stream for a networking company or for a storage company and all of the enterprises, uh, enterprise companies, how they were adopting with, uh, uh, with, with technology started coming, uh, coming out. And you can see quite a few, if, if you take a look at the timeline, uh, uh, there were quite a few projects which came out uh, of, the, of, of uh, 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 many organizations and also uh, quite a few of, uh, like, like I said, uh, Docker earlier, earlier on, they used to use uh, uh, um, uh, LXC as the container, but then again they started their own uh, container runtime called uh, lib containers. Uh, and also they, they included ContainerD as uh, the daemon for, for, for running the project. And quite a few of these uh, uh, companies started collaborating in the first version of the uh, container uh, runtime, uh, the, the OCI specs came out uh, after that. And if you take a look at it, um, uh, the Docker containers, the way uh, people were writing Docker containers, and then once the specs were introduced, quite a few players started coming into this whole ecosystem. So OCI is one of the first, uh, uh, f first standards uh, or the standardization effort which, which took place. And uh, this one had like, uh, 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 this one had uh, various specs which were published, how an image should look like, how a runtime should look like, and how a distribution should look like added on uh, a bit more later. Uh, so when OCI was working, Kubernetes also was working on another uh, standardization effort for what a runtime in Kubernetes should look like. And that's where the Cryo project also came out uh, during the same time, around 2017. Uh, so what happened with this is uh, it kind of made, uh, anybody can come and contribute to the container runtimes, and anybody can make their own container runtimes. As long as they're compatible, uh, they're not uh, uh, breaking any of the specs or the implementation. Uh, and OCI and, uh, OCI and uh, Cryo also had a, a way to interface with each other because all the Cryo commands, uh, Kubernetes uh, now started interacting with Cryo uh, in order for, you, uh, for the container images to come out and also interact with the, uh, with the host things. And uh, one of the major uh, things is um, from the security point, uh, Alexi, uh, uh, Alexi and the technologies on which the most... Uh, uh, most co uh, uh, container runtime engines started doing is a daemonless and a, and a rootless uh, uh, containers running over here from the security isolations. Uh, and this one kind of added to more adoption and more uh, user, user namespaces and all of these things being hardened uh, for, for, um, uh, to, to make containers more secure. Uh, so, so somebody had asked a question about uh, container security and also how open source projects are, uh, uh, are, are going um, I mean, there's a lot of consumption of open source software. Who, who gets the responsibility of it? One of the ways in which you can offload that responsibility is to containers. And if you know what exactly your applications want to consume from your underlying host or so thing, you can get fine-grained uh, control on what, what are their interfaces and what are the resources uh, uh, in which you can get these applications consumed from the underlying technologies. So this is how the container runtime ecosystem looks like. A uh, few of the projects uh, 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 like CRCO, ContainerD, all of these projects were contributed. Uh, I mean, Docker contributed ContainerD project. And then uh, various other uh, communities. At that given point of time, between 2015 and 16, Chorus was one of the companies which got acquired, uh, which got acquired into Red Hat uh, eventually. Uh, so they had their own container runtime called uh, Rocket. So what, what, what and all technologies which we'll be talking today, like Podman and all, you can see its uh, legacy in, in, in Rocket running as a daemonless container and uh, uh, how it has been hardened. 
So these are a few of the container tools uh, which will be working, uh, which will be uh, demonstrating and all the app which has been running on your mobiles to see how these technologies empower things. So uh, Podman is one of the projects, it's a client-only tool uh, which, is, which has a compatibility with Docker CLI. So there have been many developers who have adopted Podman. All they have done is uh, uh, done an alias uh, in their Unix shell commands from Docker to, uh, sorry, uh, from, from uh, uh, alias of Docker to Podman, and they have been just running. They have been running Podman in the back using the Docker commands, uh, and nothing, nothing's been breaking. Uh, and uh, it's been, it's been, uh, uh, it's been wonderful the way this project has been adopted, because this project had an advantage that it saw, it saw the way uh, people were running Docker, but then it also took into account of uh, security and how people want to, uh, uh, people consume containers, and uh, like. Uh, the name itself, pod manager, it's a pod manager. So most of you know a pod uh, in, in Kubernetes uh, as a con it's the, it's the uh, lowest compute unit in K Kubernetes in which you can uh, deploy one or more containers. So pod, Podman started off that. The advantage of Podman is it's no daemon. So any application by itself is isolated within its own environment over there. So there have been many, uh, I mean, if you've been following the Kubernetes ecosystem from 2016 and all, quite a few of the security vulnerabilities of Kubernetes was because uh, you, you were running the container runtime and it had access to all your underlying hardware. What this one does is because it is isolated by itself, by design, only those applications have access into its own container and and, and it has its own namespace. So you can take parallels to the earlier CH root, what we're speaking on in, in, in uh, 1979. Even they were trying to achieve the same thing. But here it's more easier. And uh, Docker, uh, Docker contributed in a great way because they kind of abstracted the way people can build containers uh, without much of system knowledge, underlying system knowledge. But, but, uh, but then any technology it would have its pros and cons. The cons were like it was giving access to all your underlying shared hardware resources and uh, various runtime resources. And another project, RunC, RunC was also uh, developed in the similar time uh, for, for being the runtime for, for the containers. And also uh, most, of the, most of these, uh, uh, these uh, technologies uh, run without root and they also run in isolated namespaces and uh, it also makes auditing of your applications easier. And it also, it also complements very well with the Kubernetes ecosystem. So if you take a look at all of the uh, all of the v, uh, containers which have been deployed in production and all of those things, all kind of data, where do you want to, how do you want to isolate your applications and how do you want to secure your applications and how, what kind of applications require what kind of privileges, all of those things you get fine grain control with Podman. And Podman also does rudimentary builds of your, uh, uh, rudimentary builds of your system too. So, so, yeah. And there are other uh, tools in this ecosystem along with Podman. Uh, Builder on Scopio is one of the popular tools in the same ecosystem. You use these things as, like, like a Trinity uh, applications. Uh, so you can get all of these three working together in order to be more productive and more uh, things. So the main thing is uh, Podman, which is, uh, uh, which is a rootless, uh, daemonless uh, container. And then uh, you also have advanced namespace isolations. Uh, in, in, uh, it can also do rudimentary builds. It's, uh, if you have uh, certain projects in your build, build pipeline, you can use Podman to build that. But in order to get more fine-grained control on your build, uh, your applications, you can also look at Builder. So if you have complex rules to write uh, and, and a way to secure your applications, so Builder is also one of the projects. And all of these projects are written with standards in mind, the standard like the Open Container Initiative. And uh, most of these builds, so, so the thing is, uh, to mitigate uh, quite a few security lists or supply chain attacks and all, you need to look at your code and how you're packaging your code and also how you're distributing that code to the operations teams. So uh, projects like Podman Builder make you, uh, make, make you do the right builds and the right decisions because um, all of these projects have compliance with the uh, compliance with the interfaces, and also by design, they 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 uh, kind of um, I mean they don't have a socket or uh, like those things. So it kind of makes you do secure builds. And the last tool is Copio, because uh, the container ecosystem kind of uh, uh, kind of blew up in terms of people writing containers and all. Even the the base image of the containers, people don't really think what kind of uh, what kind of base operating system they're running it because all these are key decisions from the supportability point of view. Yes, you're moving fast, but also you need to inspect what are there in these packages and what are um, uh, uh, you need to inspect these packages and you also need to. Uh, uh, 
uh, move your images from one container registry to another container registry. All of these things uh, you can use Scopio for. And uh, why I'm saying that you need to use all of these tools is, uh, like I said, uh, most of the dependencies, if you're not an author of it, you're not sure what is written in those code, what is written and bundled in those packages. We have seen quite a few instances of, like, say, um, NPM is notorious for this, of having malicious uh, code uh, within their own repositories. And even last year, there were few of the, uh, few of the malicious softwares uh, which, which made it through uh, the Python uh, uh, the, the Python repositories and all of those things. So you need to inspect what is there in your package. And Scopio is one of those uh, one of those tools which can uh, inspect these container images and showcase uh, what is there and uh, how you can uh, how you can consume these uh, in production. So uh, this brings us to Podman Desktop. So Podman Desktop uh, provides you a very you know a, a developer centric UI for managing your containers locally. You can run it on Mac, Windows, you know, Linux. Uh, you're familiar about Docker Desktop, so it provides you kind of, you know, a, a develop-centric UI through which you can manage containers. One interesting fact about Podman, the name is, uh, it's, it's Pod Manager, right? So uh, you can run uh, multiple containers, which are kind of bundled together like a pod uh, from the nomenclature of Kubernetes, so it's like Pod Manager. And through Podman, you can run pods without even Kubernetes. So that's the beauty of, uh, you know, uh, Podman and Podman Desktop provides you uh, a way, a user-centric way to uh, manage your containers locally on your on your machines. It comes with you know interesting features like VPN, proxies, and image registry. So if you are working in the, like in a closed uh, uh, environment where you know you don't have access to everything, so you could use and configure your VPN proxies uh, into Podman. And through Podman Desktop, you can also connect to remote uh, OpenShift clusters. At the moment, you can also connect to Kubernetes cluster in, in future. So, so in like a, a month back, we have announced the GA for Podman Desktop. So go check it out, podmandesktop.io, and download that. And it provides you a nice user interface for all your containers uh, running on Podman. By the way, you can also use it for, for Docker running, managing Docker containers, just FYI. The next tool that we have in our kitty is uh, OpenShift extension for Docker Desktop. So if you are, you know, kind of using Docker Desktop at the moment, you can you can go to the extension option in Docker Desktop and get, um, you know, an extension through which you can seamlessly push your apps or local containers or local images that are on your machine. I'm going to show this live uh, in a moment and push it to, uh, you know, remote OpenShift and Kubernetes cluster. It's just a way for you to one-click deployment of your containers, not only just on your local machine, but you know, just to uh, a remote host, just provide the credentials, the endpoints, where you want to deploy it. So it's very easy as a developer for you to showcase your app to your colleagues. Like, hey, you know, I've deployed this uh, instant app uh, on, uh, on, you know, on, on a remote Kubernetes cluster. You don't need to play with manifests, you don't need to play with YAML files, so it just magically works. I'm gonna show this, uh, I think, just now. Let's, let's, see, let's see how this looks like. Okay, so what I'm going to show you at the moment is uh, I have this uh, kind of, you know, a code repository where I, it's a JavaScript, uh, HTML JavaScript based game, nothing fancy at the moment. Um, here's, my, here's my code and uh, as usual, I have a Docker file in uh, somewhere living in my code repository. It's a very basic Docker file, it just uses a UBI image and you install Python and just, you know, I have, a, you know, all the other JavaScript files on my, on my remote, uh, on my local directory. I will expose some ports and I will just launch a very basic, you know, uh, web server to host my application. So what we're going to do next is, uh, I'm going to also give you this, uh, uh, this thing, uh, the instruction. So I'm, together with you, I'm going to follow this instruction like, you know, you will typically go to any Git repository, read the documentation and try to adapt and learn as you, as you go along. So... I'm switching back and forth between two windows here. And uh, uh, before I go into this, I have two environments uh, for this demo. We have uh, our OpenShift uh, developer console from, uh, yeah. And then we have another environment, which is uh, uh, Azure Red Hat OpenStack. And we're gonna use this as we move along in the demo. All right, so uh, I'm into, let me connect to my instance. It's a rel machine. I'll do an SSH. I'm going to show you this on RHEL. And I'm a fan of ZSH. Let's quickly go into that. Okay, so it's a, it's a machine running on RHEL. It's, it's a developer machine on RHEL, right? I can do basic commands like Podman, 
image is, it will show me, okay, there's one image. I'm not going to build it live, but uh, we'll just run it. Not from scratch, but it will pull, pull up the changes. So as a developer, you have your code base living in your local machine. So if I do a CD racing game app, which is my, my, uh, my local repository, so I have everything in here which is needed. So I'm, I need to kind of build a content image out of it. And we're going to use Builder for this. So let's understand the, um, oh, wait on. Let's even not do go to containers. Let's run it even without containers. We'll do containers as a stage, stage two. So let's validate that this works. So I'm going to spin up a minimalistic web server, Python HTTP server on port 80. And technically, my app should be running and should be accessible. Right, so let's quickly validate that. Uh, this is the kind of public IP of my, of my instance, and boom, my application works. Right, it is, it's not using containers at the moment, no containers, just basic web server running somewhere. Right, let's kill it off. We'll see it later. As a developer, your next job is to containerize your app, which means pack your app, like, like build a container out of it, right? So let's see how it looks like. So we're gonna use Builda. Build a BUD, build a BUD, build using Docker. So I have a Docker file, but I'm going to use Builda as a CLI tool to do it, which means Builda can work pretty nicely with, uh, uh, with Docker compatible files. And then I'll provide just a name, a tag to my, to my image repository. I'm calling it like Hovercraft because uh, it looks cool. So I'm going to build it using BUD. So it will kind of read all the instructions which are there in my Docker file pull it, install it, uh, you know, pack my, uh, pack my app files in there, install the dependency that I've already informed, informed, and then, you know, I have got my, my container image locally at the moment. If I do uh, images, it will show me, it's here, like, okay, localhost, Karan, and you know, this image is, is, is up and running. It's there on the machine. Next is, we want to tag it, tag it so that we can push it to an external registry. It could be a private registry, it could be a public registry, it depends on you. I'm going to use Quay.io as our, our destination registry to, to push our image into. So for this, I need to tag it. So it's uh, like you do in uh, like Docker tag, uh, it's, it's kind of same. So build a tag from local to, to, my, to my, few, uh, my destination remote registry. I have it. And as a developer, the next thing would be, okay, cool. I now have a container image locally on my machine. I want to test it locally. Is it working or not? I'll run this command and do um, podman run, like, you know, Lavranti was mentioning about, you know, you can put an alias to Docker and, you know, uh, you can make it Docker run, which will underneath use podman. So that works. So the CLI is, is podman CLI is, is super compatible with, with Docker CLI. So all the options, all the tools that you, that you work, uh, work. Okay. So my ATAD is, uh, is already in use. Let's Debug this. Okay. Let's fill it out. Start party. Should be fine. Start kill. Boom. Destroyed. Let's run the game. Okay. Now my container is running. Yeah. So my container is running on my local machine at the moment. Fantastic. What can I do with this? I can still go to my app, which is this one, and refresh this earlier. I mean, you're still seeing the UI because my browser has cached all the all the assets for JavaScript. It is still, it will not work. I mean, if I refresh right now, it will work because my container is up and running. But you got the idea, right? So uh, I'm going to do a hard refresh here. So now at the moment, it's using port 8080 in the top, which means it's coming up from the, from my container. Right? My container is listening to my app. Cool. We have we have tried to begin uh, start this app using non-container. We have containerized it. We have built an image, and then we have ran it using Spot. We so, are so good so far. Yeah. So one yeah. of the things uh, what what uh, Karan has done is uh, earlier when he was running the uh, application just with Python, so he had access to all the system's memory, the CPU, everything. It was not isolated. If there was any malicious code in that, it could take access of your memory. And, but here what is done is uh, by just replacing, uh, uh, by running it in Podman in the back end, now it's running it with rootless privileges and also a daemonless way. So whatever happens within that application is within that own 
that that own uh, namespace or that, that own boundaries of the applications. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very important point at the moment. Yeah. Before that, my code can literally go and and you know uh, wrap around all the resources on my machine. But now since I've containerized, it cannot. And just to validate, look at the ID. I'm not running as ID zero, which means root. I'm not root on this machine. I'm just you know a user has one called PC to user. It's a remote server uh, that I'm using. It's a well nice. Okay, good. So next, next is we have a we have an app which works, but let's do and do some inspection of my app. We're going to use Scopio inspect command to kind of inspect uh, going to the container and, and validate you know how things are going. Let's run this command. It gives you you know a, a big output like okay you know details about uh, about my image and you know description coming from the UBI. By the way, universal base image uh, Red Hat UBI, universal base image UBI, uh, which you can use to kind of Build, uh, use it as a base for building your container images, right? It's, it's based on well. Okay, so inspection is done. It has given me some more information around my system architecture. That's okay. Next is let's go and kind of you know um, copy this image, copy this image to Quay because my image is still on my local machine. It is tagged as a, as a new tag on my, but the image still exists on my local machine. I need to push it out, right? So let's push it using Scopio. I'm going to log in. I guess my credentials are not here. So credentials. Sure. So one of the advantages of Scopio is, uh, like, if you want to inspect an image, you don't have to pull that image uh, into, uh, into your system. You can just use Scopio command to inspect that image, even if it's posted on the repository uh, out there. So, right. All right, so I have authenticated against against, uh, against Quay, and next is I need to push my image from a local box, a local machine, onto a remote registry, which means I'm going to do a copy. So this command is, command is very interesting. So what I'm doing is I'm copying using my local machine storage, like containers dash storage, which will kind of access my my local file system, and uh, and you know push it to the remote registry. So double checking. So container storage is my local machine. Uh, Quay.io is my remote path, and uh, using Docker semantics, I'm pushing it to Quay.io as my registry. Okay. So not, 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 do not get confused here, because in the next command I'm gonna do something else. So I'm moving image from a local onto a remote Quay registry. It might take a few minutes, seconds. Done. Because the image already exists. Now it's moving kind of you know, the different layers uh, that part of this image uh, in, the, in the destination. So yeah, my image is now in the remote Quay registry. That's nice. All right. One interesting thing about uh, Scopio, which kind of, kind of, I mean, I use it, is uh, you know, through Scopio you can copy images from one remote registry onto a remote registry, like you know, the, the SCP of the cloud. SCP for for container images without involving uh, kind of you know other dependencies. So I'm going to log into this time to a different registry, which is Docker in this case. Okay, I missed username, which means I need to try. Oh, login succeeded <laughs> because we already cached. Okay, so the next command is I'm going to copy it from Quay from one remote registry onto another remote registry, which is Docker. Okay. So this this command could be useful for you if you want, like, you know, want to move it from your let's say your your in-house uh, uh, private repository to let's say a, a different private repository or public repository, public repository and local to public. You know, you can do a lot of great things uh, uh, around this. Okay, now it's claiming that it's a bug now. <laughs> it has previously told me that it succeeded, but uh, let me authenticate it once again. Okay, login succeeded. Let's try to uh, copy it one more time. Okay, yeah, now this works. So, as a recap, what we're doing right now is we're going to show you, uh, we are showing you the, the benefits of Scopio, copying from one remote registry to another repository, right? So, 
while this is going on, let's let's talk about you know uh, apartment desktop. How does it look like? Okay, you know, uh, let's suppose one of your colleague wants to try out your app in his in his local machine. Then you know, using Podman. So we have this Podman. I have Podman thing running at the moment here. So it connects to you know, uh, it detects uh, the Podman in this up or not. You can kind of you know power it on, power it off, do all basic things that you would like to do uh, from a UI. Suppose that it also detects you know Docker. So if Docker containers are there, images are there, it will kind of detect it. Okay. So it's a nice UI. Uh, we have we have no containers at the moment running on this machine. Uh, we have uh, two Docker images, uh, uh, image which, I, which I have already pulled up just to save some bandwidth and save, save some time here. As I told you, you can run containers, uh, multiple containers, join them as a pod. You can do it, and you know you can do other interesting things uh, using Podman. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of my image and uh, kind of launch it. Okay. Uh, yep. So I'll just click on this play button, give it a name. Okay, that nation and put it to start a container. You don't need to even run those, you know, Docker run command or you know, apartment run command. You're using using apartment desktop. You can kind of very intuitively manage your containers. So um, now, if I hover on on this row here, which is my running container, I can you know I can open up my app. I can go to the CLI. I can, you know, check the YAMLs. Uh, you cube generate the YAML file for this. I can deploy it to, let's say, Kubernetes. I can stop it, delete it, re restart it. You know, all those things we can do. So, so now I clicked on that button. It has opened up my uh, localhost port 8080 on this machine, right? Okay, this is good. But uh, uh, I want to deploy this to, let's say, uh, OpenShift. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on uh, deploy to Kubernetes here. And it will pick up your um, your logged in uh, context, Kubernetes context. Okay. So let me change it real quick. So this is OpenShift sandbox. It's your charge for all the developers here, uh, uh, and you know, for the rest of the world. Go to go to the developers. Get, grab your free account on this. I'm going to show you how to log in. So once you're logged in into the system, you need to have you need to get the token to get it correct. I'll authenticate using sandbox. I'll get the token here, and I will use this token and authenticate on my local machine. Okay, not this window. It should be this window. This is my local machine. Sandbox. Okay, you log logged into. You will see. You will see for my show server. Yeah, I'm I'm into my uh, my OpenShift uh, cluster at the moment. So what we're going to do is we'll quickly uh, restart so that it can get the context back. I'll double click on my app. Uh, one of the things is if you're a power command line user, there are quite a few tools and uh, quite a few effective tools. Uh, in the Red Hat developer ecosystem, OC is one of the tools very popular with the ops folks and all. Another tool called uh, OpenShift Do, Odo. Uh, we have a talk on it later today, even those things. So if you're a developer who has been used to only, you know, command line of doing stuff and, you know, pushing stuff to repositories and all and having the same Git kind of a workflow, you can use both of these tools, OC and Odo in, in tandem. And most right. of the commands, what you're seeing here, like Podman and all, if you use Docker, it's pretty much the same commands because it's Compatibility with the Docker CLI uh, in most of these uh, uh, most of these uh, demos. What we're showing. Yeah. All right. So we are into OpenShift at the moment. We have no parts, right? I have a container running locally on my on the machine. Now, with single click, I want to push this container image to let's say remote OpenShift. So I clicked on this button called as you know deploy to open deploy to Kubernetes. It has given me uh, it has auto generated the YAML file which we don't need to write a single line. It has detected the Kubernetes context through which I have logged into the machine, and if I hit like you know deploy, it should go and you know uh, deploy my app onto my uh, Kubernetes cluster, and uh, waiting for the container, container creating, kind of let validate this. Yes, my pod is now has magically appeared on a remote OpenShift cluster without even writing a single line, and if I click open in OpenShift console, I should be able to see my app running. 
by going to networking and routes and I have this, uh, this app in here and uh, yeah now my app which uh, I've been playing around it is it has been available for, for public it, it has been released right so this was Podman desktop and real quick touching upon um, the extension for open uh, the docker extension so if you go to uh, docker desktop go to extension and here it provides you a facility to select the right Kubernetes uh, cluster, the right open source cluster you want to deploy on, select on the target, uh, you know, uh, clusters and you can select the image, which image you want to deploy again. So, it's as simple as, you know, you don't need to run a container. You should have an image in your Docker locally, select the image from here, right, and then I'll sh also show you how to change it. So, this is still using my previous OpenShift set sandbox. I'm going to edit this and log into uh, log into an OpenShift cluster here, and I'll pick up my second uh, OpenShift cluster here from Azure. Right, there are no pods at the moment. I'll go and copy my commands. Okay, so I think uh, uh, the time is up, and uh, I mean. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the demo is here. So what you just need to do is you just need to put up, you know, the credentials for this OpenShift cluster in here. And as soon as you launch it, it will kind of, you know, move this and deploy your app onto um, onto an OpenShift cluster or Kubernetes cluster. So, so with that, we want to just finish off and uh, let the other people, other, other speaker, take the stage. And thank you so much. And uh, uh, yeah, and you still have this slide. You can click up, and my app is still running and play play a cool, uh, you know. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, we, are, we are using the, this Podman, and also Good. we are having an additional Docker. Right? So, so when you go to any clients, okay, the recommendation of this Podman is that you can Docker. What are the steps like for you to discuss as a developer or like an, as an architect? Mm -hmm. Most of the steps like what you've done, you can do it through Docker. Right, like the, what it's a different now we can do for a session. You go you ask us to think of three tools, what is part one? So two more, right? Uh, for a building as well as kind of thing. Okay, those steps we can do in the Docker itself. And and another thing is right, like uh, it is a Docker registry, image registry, right? All image registry repository provides like a wonderful check when we are going to push the images. And like to pull the images. Right, like, just give kind of message steps like oh, you use this, right? Like uh, these are the advantages. So right, like uh, using like uh, YAML files and uh, configuration files, you can deploy any of the containers to different uh, uh, like uh, platform as a service for OpenShift and Amazon and uh, AWS. Just to give some like so yeah. So um, I mean, we are developers. BU. We are here to provide you the right tools for the right job. I can see that there are a lot of tools here, but each team has a specific uh, reason to do it. I think we are about to start for this, but uh, let's let's catch up outside and definitely we'll talk about it. I mean, we can have a great. Experience.